Well, this is the vanguard circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund, uh, and uh, I am Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, where I completed my doctoral thesis on nation, society, and the state, subtitled The Reconciliation of Palestinian and Jewish Peoplehood, was at the uh, University de Quebec à Montréal. And it is an important sort of addition in political philosophy that integrates the notions of both national identity and class. And this is a work furthering the perspective and the political theory emanating from the Jewish Bund historically and from the Jewish Socialist Bund in particular here now. So I will continue with the reading of the study in the book by Lars Fischer which is entitled The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State, which is a critique and analysis and expose of the Second International Marxist leadership, both Jewish and non, <laughs> more so Jewish, actually. Okay, let's continue here. We'll go to share. And this is all set up properly, and we can, can begin immediately. Strangely enough, the quote-unquote mitigating circumstances that actually might help explain Leibniz's vehemence seems to have been entirely overlooked. Throughout the articles, Leibniz made numerous remarks indicating that his ire was in fact directed primarily against the German refusards. In France, he claimed, the campaign is nowhere near as strong as it is in Germany, even though, as the French do, they are making far more of a song and dance about it. Quote, was it not just totally absurd, he asked, quote, to proceed with the campaign for a man in prison for treason in that country to which he was supposed to have betrayed his fatherland? That was totally grotesque, unquote, he insisted. The quote-unquote outbursts of the German Dreyfusards quote, against a band of forgers, criminals, quote-unquote, degenerate Frenchmen, quote-unquote, were reminiscent of the wildest orgies of war fanaticism in 1870-71, unquote. He criticized, adding that among those supporting the campaign, quote, the German press sinned particularly badly. Liberal and democratic papers indulged in an orgy of anti-French chauvinism, Franzosenfresserei. <laughs> A funny word that must have inspired envy in our most bigoted Junger and police patriots. And that was restrained only by their anti-Semitism. <laughs> this chauvinist orgy was, after all, being enacted in honor of the Jew Dreyfus. Franzosen Fresserei means literally um, um, the overindulgence of French. In other words, pigs, you know, like gluttons. Gluttons is the word. Yeah, Fresserei means gluttons. French gluttons, gluttons in political identity as well, presumably, meaning chauvinism. Huh. <laughs> Multi-purpose word. Okay, fine. Okay. Now we continue with Lars Fischer. What if the boot were on the other foot? If Dreyfus were a German officer and an organized press campaign for him transpired primarily in the French press, he asked, what would those now supporting Dreyfus in Germany make of that? His critique held, quote, through most of all the campaign as it transpired in Germany, unquote, he clarified. Quote, charity begins at home, quote, he wrote in English, finally revealing his genuine concern. By way of an exception, he then added that, quote, the press of free countries differs from the press of unfree countries in that it uncovers the faults at home at home and only then deals with those abroad. 
Otherwise, it's the reverse. Within limits, Liebnecht had a point. All other things being equal, a Dreyfus affair admittedly could not have transpired in Germany, as has been pointed out many times, because a Jew would never have made it into the general staff. Period. Moreover, French society was actually torn down the middle by the convulsions of the affair, whereas its German counterpart, confronted with a similar situation, would at best have frayed at the edges. What then gave parts of the German public who were either at peace with the state affairs or incapable of altering it the legitimacy to denounce the situation in France? Franzosenschwesserei may well have played a role among German Dreyfusards, and this is an issue that would merit closer examination. Yet Liefnitz's response to the hypocrisy and complacency that may have characterized the German Dreyfusard's efforts nevertheless seems grossly disproportionate, both in form and scope. It is worth noting, though, that Liebknecht certainly did take the stipulation that, quote-unquote, charity begins at home, when comparing conditions at home and abroad very seriously. This was not a notion he made up on the spot to rationalize his anti-Dreyfusard animosity. He, in fact, took it so seriously that his adherence to it aroused open conflict within the party on at least one occasion. Liebknecht's recollections of his journey to the United States with Eleanor Marx and Edward Aveling in 1886 are an interesting case in point. As Lost Hermann has pointed out, not Lost, Jost Hermann has pointed out, these recollections offer neither an account of Liebknecht's actual activities and experiences on that trip, nor an actual portrayal of the state of affairs in the United States. They offer a semi-fictional, utopian account designed to present the United States, or rather, his dream America, quote-unquote, as, quote, a positive foil for the, to his mind, extremely negative state of affairs in Imperial Germany, unquote. Quote, in the final, more than more theoretical section, unquote, Hermand suggests, quote, Liebknecht develops his vision of a liberated classless society that he indeed calls America, but that at the same time encapsulates the vision of a different, better German Reich. We have already come across Liebknecht's Marxist memoirs. There, to add another stone to our mosaic, Liebknecht explained that, quote, patriotism is a disease by which a sensible person is only befallen abroad. At home, there is such an abundance of wretchedness that anyone who does not suffer from brain paralysis and curvature of the spine is immune to the germ that carries this political dizziness, also known as chauvinism or jingoism. Lessing said, Quote, in Saxony, I praise Prussia. In Prussia, I praise Saxony. <laughs> and that is the most sensible patriotism, one that seeks to remedy the defects of the fatherland by pointing to the real or ostensible better example abroad. I have benefited from adherence to the dictum by Lessing from an early age. Really? Okay. In April 1897, finally, Schoenlangt took Liebknecht to task for a report on his recent lecture tour in the Netherlands. Schoenlangt was the founding editor-in-chief of the Leipziger Weltzeitung, the astounding party day, daily then, even then. It was there that he aired his misgivings in an editorial. As Schoenlangt Lank, Lank, Schoenlank, 
Ah, oh, yeah. Noted in his diary on the 5th of April, he would give Liebknecht a piece of his mind for the gushing praise, Lobhudelei, of conditions abroad meted out at our expense. Quote about Schoenlank caused quite a stir and the ensuing controversy raged on in the press, party press, for a full month. Liebknecht, with Kautsky's support, vigorously defended himself against Schoenlank's critique. Mehring, on the other hand, supported Schoenlank. The two had previously barely been on speaking terms. Mehring's own relationship with Liebknecht was turbulent, to say the least, and Schoenlank's critique of Liebknecht thus provided a worthy opportunity for a reconciliation between them. That Liebknecht's writing had harmed the party for now many years, Mehring wrote to Schoenlang, is, after all, communis opinio among the sensible members of the party. That is a matter of opinion. If you now tell it as it is and criticize the silly whitewash of conditions abroad in a recent manner that is, if anything, too timid, then it was the duty of the press, party press, to support you, not to pounce on you, as most party papers have done. How much interest this dispute drew is demonstrated by the fact that Gerlach rested in an article he published when Liebknecht died more than three years later. Quote, one of his pa own party comrades, Gerlach, explained, quote, the astute député Schoenlang demonstrated in a much-discussed article that he, Liebnik, still lugged the unpleasant habit from his exile, along being behind him of underestimating everything at home and overestimating everything abroad, unquote. Schoenlang had indeed written that the urge to exagger exaggerate the merits of other countries at the Germany's expense was, quote, an old and unpleasant habit of the time in exile, unquote. This is surely a remarkable and extremely patronizing suggestion. Schoenlang effectively treated Liefnick's stance not as a political, but as a psychological issue. Hmm. Perhaps more importantly, though, this remark was not really directed against Liebknecht alone. Schoenlang's remark obviously implied that those comrades who had been in exile were generally inclined to judge the state of affairs back home with undue harshness, while being more lenient in their evaluation of the countries that had offered them refuge. Ta -da. The main line of argument would be this. It might be psychologically understandable why people who were forced into, ex into exile would adopt this skewed approach. But if one returned from exile, there was obviously no justification for maintaining it. In part, Schoenlang suggested that conditions had improved since. Ultimately, however, he was in fact implying that the exiled karma's harsh perception of the situation in Germany was only ever psychologically understandable, but never merited by the facts on the ground. What really dared speak its name in Schoenlang's contention was a presumably quite widespread sense of unease and resentment caused by the fact that the party's official ideology was no indigenous growth, but had been developed abroad and was essentially an internationalist import. As far as I can see, this is a topic that has hardly been discussed in the literature and would merit careful examination. That the bulk of ordinary German social democrats were, in fact, in fairly wide sense of the word, Lasellians at heart, rather than Marxists in any meaningful sense of the word, is surely one of history's worst kept secrets. As is well known, Marx was highly critical of the program agreed upon when the Lasallian ADAV and the Marxist SDAP, under the leadership of Liebknecht and Babel, merged at the Congress of Gotha in 1875. At the time, even for the leaders of the Eisenacher faction, quote, insofar as they had understood Marx, his doctrine was, as Schorske put it, worth less to them than the achievement of unity in the labor movement. 
This not only meant that they did not act upon Marx's critique. They effectively suppressed Marx's critique until he ran up to the Congress in Erfurt in 1891, when a new program was due to be agreed. Engels, quote, made the most of the opportunity, unquote, by persuading Kautsky finally to publish Marx's critique of the Gotha program, now some 15 years old, but even then had to agree to its publication in a sanitized version. There is an added irony even to this publication, though. For Engels had formulated a critique of the draft for the new program to be agreed in Erfurt. While the Social Democratic leadership was now finally brave enough to publish Marx's critique of their old program, it nevertheless refused to publish Engels' critique of the draft of their new program. Again, same problem. It, in turn, was not deemed fit for publication for another decade. No reason given. The appropriation of Marxism most certainly was no sooth uh, process that came naturally to German social democracy. Mm -hmm. it, is easy, it is easy to, <clears throat> to see why the cell, yeah, because social democrats, you know, like we're just a bunch of red lips. That's it. That's all. And even could slide into being counter-revolutionaries. Okay, let's continue. It is easy to see why the cell caught the imagination of many German socialists rather more easily than Marx and Engels. It took far less systematic thought and abstraction to understand what he had to say. For better or worse, the individual and his or her goodwill or bad faith played a much more straightforward role in the cell's scheme of things. At the same time, his belief in the inevitability of progress was essentially metaphysical and of truly startling naivety. Mm. Progress, and it turned out to be true, progress was so inevitable that it would make no difference whether one helped it along by accumulating all the might, potentially, at the command of the democratic forces, or by forming a sectarian alliance with Bismarck. Wow. His ADAV, for all its faults, had been an indigenous initiative and the focus of his political activities had been firmly German. Little wonder then that LaSalle's writings were continuously being reissued in sizable editions and that Mehring owed a good deal of his popularity within the party to his defense of LaSalle. As we saw earlier, Mehring persistently maintained that Marx and Engels, for all their superiority in the lofty heights of ideological discourse, had lost touch with the realities on the ground. Yet it was for these German realities that LaSalle had been just the man. Let's see what's coming up here. More paragraphs. Yeah, yeah, enough nonsense for today. So this is Yom Kippur and Shabbos, both at the same time. So let's conclude with the lighting of the candles. And here we go. Of course, red candles. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, Nadik Ech Shabbos. Okay, let's make a second episode in Yiddish. I'll make a second episode in Yiddish. Okay, what is this? What's the guys? So, and this is a wichtige Werte. Wichtige Werte. What is it? Wichtige. Let's make a lot of life in one of them. With Seichel, Schittwes, and Schulung. Can you understand? This is all without wissen. This is the whole thing.
Ez a leg. Oké. Okay. And that's my weekly contribution to the preservation of Yiddish. And one day it shall be reborn. And this Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, as it should be pronounced, is turning point. Because if the genocide in Gaza continues in this following year, then there's no turning back, you know, because that means that the Zionist uh, plutocracy there is bent on betting all or nothing. And by doing so, they're going for another Nakba in the West Bank because they know that they can never dominate the Palestinians, that they're on a sliding slope down in the world public opinion. And even amongst the Jewish diaspora, which are 55% of the Jewish population, now augmented by another half a million uh, Jewish Israelis that have left, probably for good, to join the other half million or million. So, you know, like the only thing going, you know, there are F-35s and F-16s and that in in and of itself, you know, is questionable and being put into question by a number of other fronts. So it is to be seen whether the Jewish people are now going to take matters into their own hands and denounce the state that has been foisted upon them as a golden calf. Or is there going to be a big schism between generations and between communities and is the Jewish-Israeli population going to split? And split means civil war. Because they're both uh, becoming very determined. And this government is not living up to uh, anything that it uh, is being held responsible for in the international arena by the United Nations. Even the in attack the uh, Malaysian UN peacekeeping forces in Lebanon, which means that they've declared war on the United Nations. So therefore the United Nations in self-defense can declare war on Israel as well. That would probably mean some level of sanctions, but it should be war, it should be much more. There should be um, a force, a UN force that takes over control of the Rafa crossing, Beta Nun, and allow the transport trucks to make it make it in. You know, just push the Israeli troops, Zionist troops out of the way. The IDF, so called, which stands for Imperialist Death Force. Now, the turning point is a turning point for the reason that the Jewish people, you know, have to decide, you know, in this coming year, and especially today, Yom Kippur, what it is that they are to be. The majority of the Jewish people, I think, now are against genocide in Gaza. They are against the occupation of the West Bank, the majority. But they have not yet come to understand what Zionism is, and they haven't even considered it. But when they do, they will come to decide that they are Jewish Bundists, because otherwise you cannot give up your Jewish identity, which is what, you know, Shlomo Sands, you know, has proclaimed to be the necessity, as if the Jewish people are guilty of what the Zionists are carrying out. Are all the Germans Nazis? No. Are even a majority of the Jewish people voting in the Israeli elections? No. Does the Israeli government represent the Jewish people as a whole? No. Does Netanyahu claim to be speaking on behalf of the Jewish people? Yes. Is he in contradiction with the empirical facts that 55% of the Jewish people don't live in the Zionist state as citizens and do not have a vote in those elections? That contradicts the claim that this guy, Merkowitz, actually speaking on behalf of the Jewish people, because nobody's asked them to do so. He only sort of speaks on certain factions of the Israeli public. 
And unfortunately, Lapid now is joining that cabinet <laughs> after the other one, labor type figure, you know, left. Incredible how corrupt the Labour Party in, in the Zionist state is. Yeah. And still a member of the Second should be expelled. Yes. Together with being sanctioned and expelled by the United Nations to begin with. Okay, we can look forward to these changes for there can be no silence in the face of genocide. And everybody knows that. Okay. Good night, good Shabbos. Good Yom Kippur.